tasked with trying to uh, provide you with overview, sort of a broad view overview of the state of the science on PFASs, and um, so let's just get into it. So I'm going to start with just giving you a little bit of background about endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, and then talking about PFASs in the body, and then uh, we're going to have Dr. Duckerman come and talk about cholesterol, preeclampsia, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and fetal exposures and outcomes. And then we're going to come back to me. I'm going to talk about thyroid, neurodevelopment, and immune function. And, and Dr. Clapp is going to talk about early indications of toxicity and harm and cancer endpoints. So endocrine-disrupting chemicals, these are the hundreds or more exogenous chemicals or mixtures of chemicals that interfere with any aspect of hormone action. Can you see it? Can you see it? Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, this is all for me. But, um, so if you think back to your biology class, um, you have a hormone, so say estrogen or thyroid, and in normal hormone action, what's going to happen is it's going to bind, <coughs> bind with the receptor on the cell membrane and elicit a response in the cell. So this is very, very basic, generalized um, endocrinology. What happens with an endocrine disrupting chemical, for example, is it may be able to bind with that same receptor and elicit a similar response in the cell. Alternatively, it may bind that receptor and block the action of the natural hormone. And so in this way, endocrine-disrupting chemicals can, like hormones, act at low levels in the body, and they also act in sensitive time windows of development. So depending on the chemical and the outcome that we're looking at, um, this sensitive developmental window can range from preconception through puberty, and now there are even studies looking at uh, menopause as a sensitive window uh, for exposure to endocrine-disrupting chemicals. And so effects um, can be in the near term, or those exposures uh, can have effects later in life. And this concept is known as the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis, or DOHAD, so you're familiar with that term. And there's now evidence that exposure to endocrine shifting chemicals uh, can impact fertility reproduction, neurodevelopment, the neuroendocrine system, and Maybe contributing to the epidemic of obesity and diabetes and hormone sensitive cancers such as testicular and prostate, breast and ovarian. So you probably hear about endocrine disrupting chemicals in the, new, in the news. Um, they're in many of our everyday products, our consumer products, um, food packaging, <laughs> uh, personal care products, and canned foods. And to make the point that many of these have not been captured by our regulatory framework. So we have had a nice overview of uh, perfluoroalkyl substances. I'm going to call them um, <laughs> PFAS. So I was talking with somebody the other day and um, I was saying PFAS and he thought I was saying um, PFAS. Well, so I'm from Boston, so they're the same to me. PFOS is PFAS and PFAS is PFOS. So um, I'm going to say PFOS and I'm going to say PFOS. Okay. Um, and <laughs> just one, one thing to point out is that the, the carbon fluorine bond is very strong, and this is part of the reason that it, it doesn't break down easily. And another important point about PFOS is, is that um, they recirculate in the bloodstream bound with protein. So a lot of the persistent organic pollutants that I study, um, they're they like to, to bind to lipids, so we call them lipophilic. And so they sort of sequester in the body in fat, but with PFOSs, um, they just sort of recirculate in the bloodstream. That's different from a lot of the other chemicals that we study. And as was mentioned, PFOSs are used in many products for state and waterproofing, food packaging, nonstick, and uh, fighting fuel fires. So we can be exposed to them through their use, um, and also when they are released into the environment, um, they can migrate to that groundwater quite easily. 
So I borrowed this slide from New Jersey, the Drinking Water Quality Institute um, has a nice PowerPoint up online. And the point I want to make is um, sort of about background exposure relative to exposure through drinking water. So at the bottom, um, this sort of white part at the bottom, this is what we're going to call our background, what everyone's exposed to on average. Um, and these bars are showing different estimates of exposure via drinking water. And so here's different drinking water concentrations. So what this is doing is it's estimating at these drinking water concentrations what proportion of exposure is coming from drinking water. And so just to make the point that uh, drinking water can be an important source, as I'm sure most of you know. And also to make the point that uh, exposures can be higher in early life, right? Because infants, most of their diet um, for the first six, of month, six months of life it is through either breast milk or formula, which is often mixed with contaminated or mixed with drinking water, uh, which can be contaminated. Um, and so both of these sources can result in higher exposures in the first year of life for infants. And like I mentioned previously, this is a sensitive window of development. And so these long chain PFASs have been phased out, um, as was mentioned. And now we uh, are seeing emergence of these replacement P PFOSs um, that we know less about. So the point here is that most of the health data that we're going to talk about today is on PFOA. Um, some is also on PFOS. We have a very small amount on PFHSS in terms of human data. And um, just to compare to, here is a list of the PFASs that have been reported in uh, the aqueous film farming phone, a triple F. And um, this is, okay. So, a lot of times I hear people say that we don't know that much about PFASs. Um, I study mainly um, organophosphate flame retardants, and those, I would say, compared to, to those emerging contaminants, we know a lot about PFOA, uh, PFOA and PFOS. Um, compared to lead, um, that's true that we know not that much, but compared to a lot of other chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, from my perspective, we know a lot. So from there, I'm going to introduce Dr. Duckman. Um, Dr. Duckman is a professor at West Virginia University. Many of you, many of you may know him from his uh, work with the State Health Study. And some of the things that we can see happening in the liver. And I'm going to start talking about a concept called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease pretty early because if, if, if I were Dr. Doolittle and I could hear the mice, I think that's what they're trying to tell us that the human data reflect that, okay? And then um, I'm going to try to hit some high points for community attendees. And of course, because we have a ground to cover and not much time, I hope to illustrate lecturing as an aerobic sport. <laughs> the, the first thing, the first aim is 
people need to think more about the dose response, okay? Most of the C8 health study, all 69,000 people who enrolled, 66,000 of whom gave their blood, were at reasonably high levels of exposure. And all the really interesting data from that were from the one water district that had two sources of water, one of which wasn't contaminated much at all, okay? So if you're a community enrolling people, it is very important if you want to see what's going on that there be some people at the low end of the exposure curve. And this is from Steenland's original article on the lipids, where if we had looked at the high doses only with that 66,000 people, we could figure out what DuPont couldn't or didn't. But anybody looking at the low end of the exposure could figure it out right away because the lower you go, the more the action was in terms of lipid outcomes, cholesterol and LDL, okay? And that turns out probably not to be an artifact, okay? Um, and for a while, the literature kept saying two things that really kind of irritated me because they were both clearly wrong at the time and now they're even more clearly wrong. One was the literature said, all this happens only at high dose, that's wrong. Another it said was, some people would say was the results for lipids are inconsistent. They're only inconsistent if you don't think about the physiology. It turns out that if you realize that most of the action is at high dose, and the PFAS, PFAS that you have, is the one that's going to do it, and that this looks like a saturation curve with an asymptotic <coughs> response, then you can see that whichever one you have is the one that's doing it. And then all the things that look different are just because people were measuring in different environments. And the PFAS in their environment was the one that was doing the work. Okay? And it did it at low dips. All right. Now, I, Stingler's results were in adults. Of course, very shortly thereafter, Frisbee and subsequently many others have shown, yes, we can also see it in children. In fact, we can see it in newborns. In fact, we can see it in kids who are exposed in utero, and we can see it later in their lives. And that's the lipid response, okay? And so something is not only acting, but it's also resetting. And this one is from Lipids and Pregnancy by Star, by, um, this one's from Maisonette et al. In, in the room. And, and there's also other articles that show the same thing. So pregnant women can be affected, their children can be affected. Um, and the wishful thinking, uh, Dr. Birnbaum already mentioned the PPAR alpha is PPAR alpha, therefore, and you don't have that much of it, therefore don't worry about it, fallacy. That's been disproved. And what they did was, as has already been pointed out, they found some, they, they, we've engineered, somebody engineered some mice that don't have PPAR alpha, it still happens, okay. So, and the second was the cholesterol goes down in rodents, so therefore the cholesterol going up in humans must be an artifact, okay? The humans have to follow the mice. Um, well, that turns out to also have been wrong all along. If you give the right mice a human-like diet, uh, it turns out that their cholesterol will go up just like humans. And what the mice are getting is something that looks like steatohepatitis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And of course the curve, and the third explanation was the curve is non-linear, therefore the curve can't be real. And that was the dumbest of all. I mean, <laughs> when you're a clinician, you would never give anybody a medicine for which the curve was only linear, okay? I mean, I mean or you would rarely give them because we don't have any medicines that are infinitely powerful all the way up to infinity. We have medicines that you titrate within narrow borders because they're all nonlinear. Okay, you would never take a baby aspirin. We would never put people on Coumadin. I mean, that, that, was, that answer never made sense. Okay. Now, the implication of that all is when we do studies, communities doing studies, please include some people who aren't in the high exposure group. So you can see what's going on. If you look at only the high exposure group, you can say, as some researchers have said, we can't see it in these 500 people. You would have needed 30,000. So please look at the low exposures. And you may also need to look at relevant subgroups, because I've already mentioned that I think this is going to be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
And the most relevant subgroup for that, you can't get into genetics, is the obese. So that may be a particularly susceptible group. So please enroll selectively enroll in obese. And I'm going to get to that a little bit in a minute. Okay. So what we have found in the, in the C8 population, um, uh, an article by Gallaud and all Tony Fletcher is in the audience and he knows about this for sure, is that some of the so-called liver functions, particularly ALT, um, which we used to call SGPT for those of you who are of ancient lineage as I am, uh, and that's the liver function that goes up if you're not an alcoholic, okay? Um, and that's clinical simplification, but it's basically clinically true. Um, uh, is very associated and surprisingly associated with exposure to PFOA. And furthermore, more abnormals above what we call abnormal cutoff, which is just a statistical association, by the way, uh, occurred. Uh, and that was shown in a subsequent article. And although both more abnormals and higher both exist, I'm going to contend to you that the higher rather than the abnormals is the thing to follow. And the reason it's more important is because disease isn't in most of us, okay? And it's the higher that we're try that's trying to tell us something more sensitively than the more abnormals. Liver functions are amazingly insensitive, okay? They are sensitive to moderately advanced disease. They are a great test if you have a population with a high pre-probability of disease, but if you understand Bayesian epidemiology at all, if you just go out and do a population survey doing liver epidemiology, you're going do, doing liver functions, you're going to miss a lot. So what you can do besides the bilirubin and alkphos and GGTs, GGTs are also, are also elevated in, um, in uh, exposure to these compounds, is you can find other ways to look at it, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and I've already mentioned that animals fed that Western diet get and fed PFASs get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They get lipid accumulations in their liver. Um, this is a picture, uh, and CV, which should be in the middle of that, stands for um, central vein. There's also a uh, central artery. Uh, if either one of those gets slow traffic, we're in Boston, we all know the central artery gets slow traffic. <laughs> um, you, you, and things slow down and it gets the out hepatitis. Uh, lots of other things can follow, and this is a high magnification picture, this is low magnification. Um, you can look at other more sensitive ways for disease. That's the point. If you want to look at early disease, you have a couple of other choices. One is expensive but non-invasive. You can do ultrasound for early disease. Um, and that would be a very interesting thing to do in a human population. That's been done in worker groups exposed to things that may cause disruption of liver metabolism. But I don't think it's ever been done in a community group. I think that would be interesting and possibly important to do. Um, we know that the gene pathways in rodents that cause the adenohepatitis are activated by these compounds. Lots of good work has been done on that. Um, this is one of, I don't know how many articles that relate to that, probably people in the audience know better than me, but it's probably 15 at this point. So just there's been probably 30 or 40 articles showing the association with, and that's both prospectively and non-prospectively, with cholesterol metabolism. We can see in the, in the rodents that there is something going on in the livers. Okay. By the way, uric acid is also associated with perfluorocarbon, PFAS exposure. Why could that be important? It's important because uric acid is one of the things we see going up in people who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that could be the same mechanism behind both could be an explanation. Um, there's one other thing that you can do, and this is from our unpublished data looking for it, and that is you can use these research markers of 
liver abnormalities going on that suggest the presence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is an unusual kind of conference to present new data at, but the timing is good because we just got these data uh, last week, so I thought I'd put them up there. This is M65 and M30 and 200 individuals serum from the C8 health population, and the beta for PFOA is just, I mean, it just sort of knocked our socks off, but this is a statistical, you know, this is a statistical look at it. I think that this is trying to tell us that the mice have the right answer, that this is going to look like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, here is something that will sound for a second like a pivot, but it isn't. In the developing humans, we know that this stuff is in breast milk, we know that's why it's, it's in breast milk, it's in menstrual blood, and it moves from mother to fetus. That is why starting about age 9, 10, 11, the beginning of menstruation, the girls don't have as much PFOSs in them as the boys because they are getting rid of it, okay? Um, that leads to some ideas about phlebotomy that we, we're going to discuss tomorrow. Uh, in the community thing, whether that's an interesting idea or not, certainly something to think about. But um, uh, small qualities can work, uh, never been tested. But we breastfeed it. Now we know that there's trans placental transfer, does it matter? Are there consequences? And I think that the answer is yes. And the reason I think the answer is yes is I want you to think like a doctor about cholesterol for just a second. Now thinking like a doctor is painful. If, if you're an internist, it's especially painful because we always have questions and self-doubts. We're not like surgeons that we go and change things. Um, but what is cholesterol? Cholesterol is just another sterol. And if the PFOSs are really, as all the data seem to indicate, messing with cholesterol metabolism, we should assume that the building blocks of all our sterol, of all our sterol sex hormones which is the same stuff, it's just the same stuff in different organs, could be messed with as well, okay? We would be surprising if it weren't. It would mean that the chemicals were smart and they knew to do it only in the liver, okay? And I don't think they're that smart. So that when Courtney and Ken talked about developmental abnormalities and Dr. Burnham elegantly reviewed them, I think they're talking about the same topic. We're talking about disruption of sterol metabolism wherever it occurs, okay? So it's all about that. The, the genes are trying to tell us, the gene studies are trying to tell us about that. This might be the mechanism of preeclampsia in, in women. I don't think we know for sure at a scientific level. I, I think we, we know for the women, the CA population, but I think that data needs reproduction and other large scale studies. Uh, the preeclampsia actually occurs. Uh, by the way, that was first noticed by a young graduate student within weeks of the time we first got the data. She's now an assistant professor at UTMB uh, in Galveston. We, and we put it up on our website back in 2006, two minute warning. Female reproduction is associated, and the point is non alcoholic fatty liver disease is trying to tell us a story. Things that we worry about that Dr. Birnbaum has already mentioned, increases in adiposity in girls exposed prenatally, possible changes in neuropsychological development after prenatal and early childhood exposure. Um, these things may have to do with sex hormones, they may not, the data are messy, lots more work needs to be done. It's easy to say and hard to find. Uh, BMI outcomes in women who are exposed prenatally all the way up through adulthood. Um, I'm not quite done. Um, TTB and TT. Sperm morphology may be affected. Immune downregulation is certainly the case. Lots of data about that. Thyroid and endocrine disruption. Thyroid's a different class of hormones. Um, and why that happens is less clear. Uh, no associations have been found in some cases, but not most. Um, Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about what health professionals can do. Uh, this is the only thing that we can do that's a, a sort of a surgical interaction. Um, uh, if you know the product, it, it's, it's, it, I hope it sticks with you. But anyway, um, uh, 
uh, I'm now at my finish line. I've been given my two minute warning. And um, what I hope to do very quickly been to pull together the various topics to say that physiologically, there's a high likelihood that a lot of them are related. And the way to study them, if not at the high dose, is at making sure you have a range of dose exposures. Um, so thyroid 
thyroid hormone is especially important for brain maturation and development. And so thyroid disruption is a potential mediator for neurodevelopmental toxicity. Um, so the, the epidemiologic literature on neurodevelopment is kind of mixed. Uh, more research needs to be done in this area. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a study from Wolhot. So this is the Faroese population that Dr. Birnbaum mentioned. And they found that higher CRM PFAS concentrations were associated with parent-reported behavioral problems, including hyperactivity, period, peer relationships and conduct problems, internalizing and externalizing problems, and autism screening composite scores. And in this study, when they were looking at um, measures of exposure using post-fail measures um, and measured in the blood of the children at ages five and at seven, and then these screenings were done at age seven, um, they found that these associations were strongest for the five and seven year olds, uh, five and seven year old measurements. And they also found that when they looked at the data uh, divided into um, male and females, or girls and boys, um, the adverse effects were stronger in the girls, and they were significant, um, but they were null or positive in the boys, so these outcomes. And so, you know, if you have a study where you combine the boys and the girls, you might just end up in the middle. And so it's important to divide, you know, your analysis in by sex, or at least to look at it that way as well. Uh, Dr. Rembrandt also mentioned this review on the paper done by the National Toxicology Program that concluded, this was published last year, um, that PFOA and PFOS are presumed immune hazards to humans. And this is based on antibody response suppression in animals and human studies, um, reduced infectious disease resistance, increased hypersensitivity related outcomes, and increased autoimmune disease incidence in humans, and uh, suppressing uh, PFOS can suppress disease resistance and natural killer cell activity. So, so for example, um, in a population in Norway, um, the <laughs> children whose blood had higher PFAS levels produced fewer antibodies to rebel vaccination at three years of age and had increased frequencies of the common cold and gastroenteritis. In the Far East population, they found that children with higher blood levels of PFAS produced fewer <coughs> antibodies after vaccination for diphtheria and tetanus. So in both of these studies, they were using vaccination as a model of immune function. So typically what happens, well, what happens when you get an immunization is your body mounts an immune response, and we can actually measure that by measuring immune titers. Um, and so what they found in these children is that on average, their response, their immune titer levels were lower if they had higher levels of these chemicals in their blood. And um, Dr. Grinchin, um, I'm standing in for today, and Dr. Clapp, who's going to speak next, published uh, an article um, in which they noted that extrapolation of the levels at which these effects are seen in children in the fair weeds, uh, extrapolation suggests that drinking water standard um, from those studies might be closer to one part per trillion. And so uh, Dr. Shader mentioned about mammary gland development, I just wanted to echo it. Um, this is a slide again from New Jersey, DWQI, um, and New Jersey ended up basing their proposed uh, drinking water standard on mammary gland development because it does seem to um, have effects at very low levels of exposure. And again, the concern with effects on mammary gland development is that it may uh, predispose to breast cancer and also may impair um, breastfeeding functionality. Um, and so I, I work with the peace community, um, and the question I often get um, from Andrea and others is, you know, how can I protect my family, right? How can I take what we know about PFASs and be proactive uh, about protecting the health of my family, right? It's a pretty reasonable question. So it's actually not a question that um, I sort of think about when I do my science. I'm technically thinking about well, does chemical A, you know, how is that related to such and such outcome? Um, so there's a couple resources that I think are useful um, for that question, and then also in moving forward in my work, I, I want to think about these questions, and this is what I've been thinking about the last couple of years. But um, ATSDR, the Agency of Toxic Substances and 
Disease Registry put out this physician fact sheet um, that I often point people towards. I think it's useful for physicians, but also, you know, a lot of physicians, they, their training in environmental health is very um, brief. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so a lot of them haven't heard of this. And so, um, you know, they're sort of surprised when people come and ask them these questions. They don't necessarily um, have the answer ready. And so if you can bring the fact sheet to an appointment, that could be helpful. Um, uh, the CU Health Study has a medical monitoring plan. It's available online, and um, this is also potentially a useful reference for folks. <coughs> also, can note that a routine physical can include some of these um, monitorings that have been recommended, and others that you might um, think would be useful. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Clapp. So, Dr. Clapp is a professor of environmental health at, um, or former. I can never pronounce the word emeritus. Em em emeritus, Professor Emerit Emeritus at Boston University School of Public Health, which is where I did my doctoral training. Um, and he's also a professor at University of Massachusetts Lowell, so um, very impressive that he is a professor at two places. And if you see him record in different ways, that's why. Um, and he's also been really useful and helpful to me uh, when I came to him saying that um, I heard about this contamination at Peace, which is my town that was in Portsmouth. He came right up and came to the community meeting with me and has been involved ever since. So thank you and and what an amazing group this is, what a thrill it is actually to see everybody in the same room. This is amazing. Um, so I'm glad to say a few words about uh, the cancer story with respect to these chemicals. Again, mostly PFOS and PFOA, um, and perhaps in reverse order, mostly PFOA. Um, I guess I should say that the reason I'm on the faculty at two places is they don't pay me either place. <laughs> but I do keep up with this. Um, let me just say this is a quick outline of what I would cover. And some of this has already been covered. I think what we're doing is we're searching through this material multiple times. I will tell you this, though. I have a, 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 an admission. I do not have a slide that has dental floss on it. So I won't be showing you that. But all this other stuff you will have already seen. Um, and some of this also has this developed historically. What do we know when? And again, a couple of previous speakers have covered that well, so I, I'm not going to go into a lot more detail on that. I will talk more about the cancer studies, especially the human cancer studies. And it's, uh, as Courtney indicated, Dr. Branchon and I reviewed this up till a couple of years ago in a, in a review article that was published in a journal called New Solutions. This is at the bottom of the page is the reference, and it's online, so I think it's free to anybody that wants to get into it, at least up to two years ago. Um, so, again, the early toxicology suggested both internally within DuPont um, and then other early toxicological literature that was published. We knew about these chemicals a long time ago, uh, in the, even in the 60s and 70s. But there was an unpublished study on in monkeys that had been done in DuPont, but it's only available and it became available through um, the lab's work uh, unearthing and as part of the lawsuit. And then they got, uh, posted in the EPA docket. Um, so there are also some published studies in the animal and toxicology literature of the 80s. Carcinogenicity, even that began to get published late 80s and early 1990. The one that's I put up on the slide here was about the carcinogenicity of PFOA in rodents that uh, in 1992 indicated latent cell tumors. These are tumors of a particular cell in the, in the uh, testis of the animals. So that was an early indication that there was a, that and others were indications that this was, PFOA in particular, was a chemical that could cause cancer. Um, early worker studies, uh, I think Ken and, and maybe a couple of other speakers mentioned that often the high dose exposures are to workers, <clears throat> and the people who manufacture these chemicals often have the highest dose exposure of anybody. 
So 3M had workers that were manufacturing both PFOA and PFOS in Minnesota. And a, a, a person who was doing his doctoral dissertation at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota School of Public Health looked at the mortality, the deaths due to cancer and other diseases, but this, the results here, will, I'll just focus on the cancer results, um, of people who had worked at the 3M facility in Minnesota, and in 1993 found this excess of prostate cancer as a cause of death. And it was uh, those who had worked 10 years or more. Often in worker studies, they do what they call lagging, where they look at people who have been exposed at least some minimum time period, because it takes at least that minimum time per period for the health effect, or in this case, the death, to occur. So for people who had worked 10 years, and then sometimes it's also had uh, been ex <coughs> exposed at least 10 years earlier, should have taken a bottle of water up here, um, there was this excess of prostate cancer. So. I said the right word, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> so the Gilliland study, <clears throat> published in 1993, was one of these early worker studies. And subsequently, <clears throat> other workers, other investigators at the University of Minnesota and also 3M, uh, one of the authors is uh, a guy named Gary Olson at 3M. He's on a lot of the publications that you'll see. He was a co-author on this subsequent <clears throat> PFOS worker study, which showed uh, excess bladder cancer. That hasn't shown up on any of the lists so far, but this is one study where there was excess bladder cancer in PFOS workers at the 3M facility in uh, Minnesota. So again, these are hints. These are suggestions that uh, in the case of prostate cancer, a hormone-related cancer might be elevated in PFOA workers, and this one, bladder cancer in PFOS workers. So it should be on everyone's radar. It was on people's radar by then. And I think the signal has gotten more consistent over time as additional studies have been published. So that's why you'll see that the uh, perhaps most consistent findings now are about kidney cancer and testicular cancer, the two that were called probably linked in the uh, C8 studies. Um, and then again, as uh, has been mentioned, I guess, both by Rob Ballot and Ken Cook, um, there were internal DuPont documents that became available as a result of the lawsuit that said they were looking at their own workers. DuPont was one of the, again, I think, uh, perhaps it was Ken who said that DuPont had a, sorry, it was Rob who said du, DuPont had one of the premier laboratories in the world, the Haskell Laboratory. They also had a premier worker surveillance system. So they could keep track of what their workers were getting either in the form of illnesses or what they were dying of. Uh, when I was first studying occupational epidemiology, um, the company that we were told had the best way of tracking what was happening to its workers was DuPont. Um, and they published this guy named Sidney Pell who just developed this uh, internal system of physician. Um, they published widely in the occupational medicine uh, journals. They don't have that program any longer, but they did have internal data uh, that was available to them that said the Washington, the Washington works employees, that's the DuPont workers in uh, Parkersburg, had excess kidney cancer and a couple of other things actually um, that were showing up internally in their own cancer risk for their workers. So just so you know, they did know early on what was going on with their workforce and cancer. Um, and then there were beginning to be published studies from authors, some of whom worked at DuPont, um, a woman named Robin Leonard in particular, was the first author of this 2008 study. And here they did show an excess of kidney cancer as a cause of death um, in the Parkersburg workers, um, published in 2008. And then subsequent studies of uh, PFOA workers have been published and have reported additional findings about increased prostate cancer in those with moderate to high exposure to PFOA. Um, and then a suggestive increase, this was looking at other causes of death, suggestive increase in stroke or cerebrovascular disease deaths. So the, the literature is getting fuller, um, and the, including the cancer results are getting more consistent. But I'd say this is still a moving target. And, and like a lot of the research, uh, Dr. Birnbaum mentioned an amazing amount of research that's underway at NIEHS and will be published sometime in the next year and maybe summarized next year. Some of that will also include 
carcinogenicity, both in animals, and I suspect there will be additional human studies uh, with respect to cancer as a cause of death or as an incident uh, disease. So we'll still learn more about this, but I think already the evidence from the uh, C8 study and the various publications of DuPont workers, European studies, uh, is getting more consistent. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. This again, this is, I think, the Parkersburg plant looking its best. Um, and so there's been a lot of information that has been learned about the health effects of uh, especially PFOA as a result of the C8 panel studies. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this. Again, several speakers have talked about it, and I'll cycle them through about a fourth time. Uh, lots of blood was collected, lots of uh, uh, endpoints were looked at. Uh, and also how it works in the environment was looked at in detail. Uh, the modeling of uh, where the pollution went underground, how it got into people's drinking water, how many people, depending on where they lived and when they lived there, were exposed and at what levels. All of that now informs these health studies. So it's a pretty remarkable um, effort that's gone on as a result of the C8 settlement and all of the C8 panel studies. Um, one of the uh, well, let me just say that the probable links, uh, which have already been listed, um, were strongest with respect to cancer for testicular cancer and kidney cancer. And both of those, uh, pa patients with both of those types of cancer were the initial cases that were uh, tried in an Ohio court that Rob was talking about. And both, in both of those instances, both the kidney cancer patients and the testicular cancer patients, the verdict was for the plaintiff. So the evidence that's appearing in court, that's resulting, is coming as a result of all of the uh, studies that have been done to date, is convincing enough to a jury. Um, and again, the, the standard of proof is more likely than not in a, uh, a court case like this. It may not be sufficient for especially international panels of epidemiologists to say, well, that shows that's the cause, but it's more likely than not or probable that kidney cancer and testicular cancer are caused by PFOA exposure and probably uh, will turn out to be other PFAS exposures as well. Um, the massive settlement that was announced earlier this year, um, I think is a major accomplishment. And again, uh, Rob Bala is the person to explain that in more detail. Just gonna say a couple more things about the uh, uh, one of the studies, Veronica Vieira here, it's listed at the bottom of the table, Vieira et al. is a colleague um, and co -author, one of her co-authors is sitting in the back, Tom Webster, uh, looked at cancer in the West Virginia, Ohio communities affected by you know, pollution from the Parkersburg plant, the, the, the DuPont plant. And I'll just highlight the, the one or two uh, findings of significance here, kidney cancer, as you can see, for High exposure and very high exposure, there was a double excess uh, of kidney cancer. Um, and again, using the uh, ability to estimate how people were exposed that was modeled as part of the C8 uh, program. So, so this is saying that for the patients who got kidney cancer versus actually the controls were other cancers, believe it or not, done through data from the, uh, the, yeah, the Ohio and West Virginia cancer registries, um, it was possible to say there was a twofold excess of kidney cancer in those that had the most exposure um, to contaminated water uh, from the Parkersburg plant. A couple of other findings is a, uh, in one particular medium exposure category, there seemed to be an excess of brain cancer, not in the high exposure category, and not in the very high exposure category. And similarly, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was kind of an inconsistent picture with a somewhat elevated uh, risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the medium exposed group in this study of the Parkersburg area, um, and in the very high exposed group, but not so much in the medium, or sorry, in the high exposed group. So the strongest picture here, I think, is from kidney cancer. This is, testicular cancer is very rare, and so there weren't a lot of cases. You can see at the bottom line there, testis, some of those risk estimates or odds ratios, as they're called, are below one, which is to be, which is to say, no excess. If it was 1.0, there's no excess. Some of those are below one, um, but they're all based on small numbers of cases. So it's not a very strong uh, finding in any in either direction for testicular cancer. 
the, the strongest finding is the uh, kidney cancer uh, result. So that's, again, more information that it's, it's a valid concern that kidney cancer is caused by especially PFOA. Um, and this is a sort of dose response that as the increased exposure goes up, the risk of kidney cancer goes up. It's another version of the same information from Vera Webster et al. So now the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is, I would say, the premier international body that reviews what things cause cancer. Uh, they've reviewed over a thousand things or conditions of exposure over their existence. Um, and over a hundred are now known to cause cancer in humans, and hundreds more are suspected of causing cancer in humans. So they call either probable human carcinogens or possible human carcinogens. So PFOA is now called a possible human carcinogen. This is what I was saying earlier. Uh, you know, causation is sort of in the eye of the beholder. And in court, it's more probable than not. And the jury has to decide whether the evidence was you know, shown to be more probable than not. These international <coughs> bodies of just scientists usually say it's got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not just more probable. It's like you can't say that there's any evidence that would, dis that would disprove that that's the cause. So to get to that level, I mean, asbestos is like that. Benzene is like that. You know, there's a list of 100 things, actually, that are like that. But PFOA is not yet. And that's, I basically think, because not enough studies have been done to have that you know, degree of security uh, for these scientists who really you know, are looking for any way to diminish the results. It's, it's sort of the training that scientists get. You be skeptical. And think of other ways that might, other things that might have caused this result in this epidemiologic study. And if there are some other things that weren't controlled for, then you give that study less weight. Um, and so that's where we're at, actually, with uh, the carcinogenicity of PFOA <coughs> and POFOS. I think it's more likely than not. In fact, I think the evidence is going to only get stronger. Um, but if I were on the IARC committee, I'd get outvoted by people who said, no, 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 it didn't take into account smoking or something, whatever it is. Um, but there is actually quite a substantial amount of evidence that's pointing in that direction is human studies and animal studies, uh, some of which I've already reviewed for testicular cancer, kidney cancer, liver cancer, especially the animal studies, um, and a rainbow two rainbow trout studies, those are my favorite. Um, <laughs> those are in the dioxin literature as well, it turns out that the rainbow trout get tumors because of dioxin exposure. Um, and there is a pancreatic study, it says here it's one rat study, I think that actually has shown up in one of these human studies as well, pancreatic cancer. So in any case, it's pointing in a direction, uh, but as of right now, the IARC, as of last year, I should say, the IARC review said, well, it's a possible human carcinogen. So I'll finish with this. Uh, these are kind of conclusions about the emerging <coughs> evidence. You know, this flew under the radar under TSCA, so a lot of the evidence that was either accumulating was in company records, but not in the published literature, or even if it was, TOSCA didn't really require uh, paying close attention to PFA, PFOA and POFOS because of the way it was written that these chemicals are already in commerce before uh, TOSCA even existed. So we, it emerged later. The information about the toxicity and the carcinogenicity of these chemicals emerged later than it should have. Um, there were early signals and either they were heated or they were flying under the radar. Um, and so it was only until the 2000s, and to some extent because of the, the, the DuPont settlement. You all should know that DuPont sold its chemical manufacturing company to, it's now called Chemours. So you may see Chemours showing up uh, in future articles about this. Uh, that's a long story in itself. Um, and so, but in any case, um, so the C8 study, which was based on the, especially the DuPont Parkersburg plan and all the things that were learned from both communities and workers who were connected to that facility has advanced our knowledge a lot. Um, so it is now considered a possible human carcinogen as is PFOS. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs>